The Discovery. I am eight years old. I trip and fall down the three brick stairs to our apartment building and scrape all the skin off my right shin. My parents have just gone inside, haven't heard me fall. I sit on the pavement, the summer day bright and peaceful around me, wondering why such a big scrape doesn't hurt. But when I get up to limp to the stairs, I feel the warm blood running down my leg, and it gives me such a strange feeling, like I am disconnected from the world. Ama, I manage to call before I sit on the ground again, dazed. Reha, I hear as Ama rushes to me. That is when it hurts. All the skin is gone, and my leg looks like meat, which we don't even eat, but I've seen at the grocery store. In the emergency room, the doctor numbs my skin with a spray before cleaning the wound and bandaging it up. I like his cheerful smile, his bright brown eyes, his quick and clever hands, how he tells me everything he is going to do before he does it. He explains how the scrape will heal from the inside out, how the oozing blood helps to clean the wound, how it brings oxygen and white blood cells to fight germs, how my skin will grow and cover everything again, and I will be just fine. And I know in that moment what I want to be when I grow up, but I can't stand the sight of blood. It brings me right back to that woozy place between sky and ground where flecks float like dust in a beam of sunlight. Daddy. Daddy is an engineer who designs buildings that won't fall down. He is logical, precise. When we're in the car, he gives me math puzzles that I do in my head. When we listen to the radio, he sings along, gets the words all wrong, comes in too early on the choruses, but that just makes me snicker. Daddy talks a lot and makes friends easily. He laughs often, his well-trimmed mustache twitching. Daddy excels at playing cards, and if I win, it's because I really beat him. You are smart, Reha, Kana, he says, but most important, you work hard. That is valued in this country. You will be anything you want to be. Drowning. I am 10 years old. My lungs are rattling. I have a sharp pain in my chest, but I'm afraid to talk about because I'm scared of what it might mean. My teacher sends me to the school nurse. The nurse calls Ama, and she picks me up and drives me to the doctor. Pneumonia. My fever is high. My hands are floating. I am sinking. Drowning. Ama spoons medicine into me, puts me to bed, and I sleep. I hear a soft murmur whispering through grass. I dream for days, for miles, across space, across time, through in infrared and ultraviolet, through constellations, a kaleidoscope dream, until a hand appears, a dark hand full of promises. I reach for it, and I wake to soaking clothes, Ama's eyes large, warm, shining with love. Ama's hand, cool, soft. Whisper gentle, holding mine. Welcome back, Kana, she says. Where had I gone? Everyone else. The other girls at school are nice enough, but sometime last year they changed. Teasing their hair into puffy clouds, wearing tiny skirts and heels, painting their nails neon colors, and acting like they don't know the answers in class, even though I know they do. They giggle all the time hang their arms around each other in the hallways, talk loudly at the lockers, hoping the boys will notice. I don't have time for such nonsense. I have things I want to accomplish. So that leaves Rachel and me, still raising our hands in class, still wearing the same clothes as last year, not worrying about what the boys think, at least not much. Our classmates spend their weekends at the mall, but Rachel and I still spend ours with our parents and their friends, our friends too, just not the ones from school. Red, white, and whole. Ama works in the hematology lab at the hospital. She spins the blood and counts the cells in the complete blood count. She counts the red cells that carry oxygen, the platelets that stop bleeding, and the white cells, the warriors protecting us from invaders, at least if they're doing what they're supposed to do. Cells and plasma together are called whole blood, which is what flows inside us. Red, white, and whole. The precious river in our arteries, our veins, our hearts. Courtly love. Pete is my partner in English. We are reading The Sword in the Stone, and we are required to discuss courtly love from medieval times, to learn about the society that King Arthur, Arthur would be ruling. Ladies were held in the highest honor. 
and knights could love noble women from afar with no hope of ever marrying them. The ladies handed small tokens, an embroidered handkerchief, a ribbon, to the knights as marks of favor before tournaments and battles. I've gone to school with Pete since first grade. He used to wear glasses, and once, when we were nine, he fell off the monkey bars, crashed to the ground. His glasses broke and cut his cheek, just underneath his eye. He stood with blood dripping down his face and calmly walked to the teacher. He never cried, never even cried out. But the world began to buzz around me and I had to look away. I was afraid of him because what kind of creature could bleed from his face and not make a sound? This year, Pete's glasses are gone. He switched to contact lenses. And if I look closely, I can see a tiny scar high on his cheek. Pete's eyes change colors with the day and his shirt and his mood. His eyes are blue, but on a cloudy day, they match the sky. When he wears green, I see bits of yellow swirling. When he's arguing a point in class, his eyes look purple. Then I stop and remind myself not to stare, which is hard because Pete is my partner in English. Do you speak Indian? At the end of French class, Tiffany comments that I'm so good at languages, English, French, and do you speak Indian? So many things float through my mind as I watch her twist a straight, silky lock of blonde hair around her finger. I want to tell her that people from India, just the small sample of Indian people in her own city, speak over a dozen languages. We are Hindu, Muslim, Christian, and other religions. We are all different shades, from dark brown to almost as pale as she is. I want to tell her we make more kinds of delicious food than she could imagine. I want to tell her, despite our differences, we have so much in common trying to make our lives here. I want to tell her I've never studied Tamil and Kannada, the languages my parents speak. Never learned to conjugate those verbs. Never learned those curly alphabets. My parents only talk in English. Talk to me in English. I want to tell her when I reach for words in Kannada or Tamil, all my brain comes up with is French I learn in school. And what I understand of the languages my parents speak is confined to the mundane conversations of home. And when I do try to talk, my accent is wrong. Wronger than my parents' accents when they speak English. But I don't tell her any of this. Instead, I just say, no. When you are different, you constantly compare. You hide and wonder, is my hair parted on the right side? Does this color look good on me? Should my lips be thinner? My mother made clothes are funny. My jeans are not the fashionable kind. They notice that my hair is black and thick. My eyes are darkest brown and my skin is different from everyone else's. Tan, they say. Wish I weren't so deathly pale. When I see their stares, I see their smugness in their own skins, their own eyes, their own selves that are so very different from me. Sisters. Amma loves it here in America, in our little house with just the three of us, but she misses her old sister, my prima auntie, who still lives in Bang Bangalore. They speak on the phone every Sunday, and Daddy never complains about the cost. They are only t There are only two of them now, orphaned, but they have each other. Prima auntie is married to Vinod uncle, but they have no children. I am the daughter that my mother shares with her, the only, only one. I'm the one who carries everyone's hope, everyone's expectations. Brothers. Daddy has three brothers, and on that side, I have six cousins, and they are all boys. Three are older, three are younger, and I am in the middle. I see them every few years when we visit India, and we are going this coming summer right before I start high school. Amma saves all her vacation time so we can go for eight weeks, and Daddy joins us for the last two. Each time we go to India, my cousins have grown taller, especially the little ones, but they stay skinny and quick. When I sit on the veranda with them playing karom, the evening breeze on our necks as we flick disc around the powdered game table. When we eat sweet jackfruit dipped in even sweeter honey. When we play cards late into the night, our laughter echoing through open windows. I am surrounded by my cousin brothers who call me sister. But then I come home, and I'm alone again. Only. When you are an only child, the house is orderly, quiet. The voices are rarely raised. Your parents only think of you. 
You don't need to share, to shout, to seem anything but what you are. But when I visit Sunny's house, the toys strewn across the living room floor, her screech when a brother annoys her, competition at the dinner table, I get a glimpse of what I'm missing. So many together. And her parents don't notice if she wears lip gloss or spends too much time on the phone. I feel exhilaration and exhaustion when I'm at Sunny's house. When I return home, where there is no sharing, no shouting, only seeming the way they think I am, voices aren't raised, and the house is so very quiet the way it can only be with an only child. Birthday parties are a big deal. They used to be fun in elementary school, with a bunch of girls gathering at someone's house, a movie, a cake, and presents. Now they are huge productions at restaurants and roller rinks, and boys are invited too. Sometimes the cheese pizza runs out, and since I can't eat pepperoni or meatball slices, I end up with only cake and ice cream. I can't enjoy myself when I'm worried that the dress that Amma made me, which is so pretty and fits me perfectly, is all wrong here because it's different. But how can I convince Amma that I need to wear a t-shirt and jeans to a party? Even worse than the parties where I feel so left out are the ones where I'm not even invited.